hear this message Tune this channel Like E.T. said Phone home Hello and welcome to episode 10 of API Case Files. I am your host, Marsha Barnhart, and the Chief of Investigations for the organization. I'll be joined later in the program by our Director, Astronomy Professor Antonio Paris, and our Deputy Director, Paul Carr, who also happens to be our resident space systems engineer. Paul and Antonio will cover their latest cases, and Paul will present another installment of his Unidentified Science series, specifically in this episode, Insight on Scientific Skywatching. And since API, the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations team, is looking for some new team members, Paul, Antonio, and I will discuss some of the attributes we're looking for in a team member. To start things off, though, on this episode of Case Files, we'll be examining multiple cases. I'll start with an instructive case out of Colorado. Interestingly, in the space of about 10 days, we received three reports from Colorado. One of these three just made a report of a strange light in the night sky and preferred no investigation. The second of the three saw an object traversing the night sky that did not look like a typical satellite dot. That case, however, was easily and quickly solved due to the witness's well-written report of the object's behavior and the specific time, date, and area that was provided. It turned out to be a flyover of the International Space Station, the ISS. The ISS does generate quite a few reports, and it's something to see. If you've never encountered it before and you have no idea what you're looking at, it can be quite an arresting sight. Whereas communication satellite flyovers look like tiny dull lights, little dots cruising across the evening sky, the space station looks like a very bright object that appears slightly longer than it is round. I think it's pretty amazing to realize that you're looking up at a fuselage that looks like a bunch of joined Legos parts and a large symmetrical solar array. Altogether, the ISS is about the size of a football field flying about 225 miles up in the thermosphere at over 17,000 miles per hour. Wow. And to realize there are six human beings operating and living in low Earth orbit, performing space-based research and conducting experiments that will one day assist mankind with getting to Mars and beyond. The ISS is not just an object in space, it's a platform for living and working in space. If you've not seen an ISS flyover, make plans to. There are multiple ways to determine when the next time the ISS might fly over your geographical location in the early evening, which is when it's easiest to see. But uh, there are a lot of apps. However, you can just hit the web and type in, when will the ISS fly over me? That should give you all the information you need. Now, the third Colorado report we received was a harder nut to crack. I'll just segue to my witness interview and start with her personal account of the object she and her husband spotted in the sky over their home in a Denver suburb around 5.30 p.m. Tuesday, September 27, 2016. My backyard faces west, um, so as I walked out off of the porch, you know, out from under the overhang, immediately out of my left um, peripheral vision, 
and up to the sky, I just started tracking a, a small white object. So as I walked out into the yard, I could see that it was moving um, sort of, I guess, from northeast, southwest. Um, and then it stopped um, right in, you know, as I was watching it move, it stopped. Um, as I was walking out into the yard, I called out to my husband and I just said I was seeing something very odd in the sky. And he came out. Um, it was still just hovering in the sky southwest of us, very high up, um, but just like a, a a white circle, um, maybe a diamond shape, but it was so far up. And my impression of it was that it was white, circular, no blinking lights or, or anything like that, although it did seem to have kind of a faint haze around it. Um, and it hovered there for quite a while. My husband um, ran in the house to get his binoculars um, and watched. we watched it hover for several minutes with the binoculars and then he came in the house and got his camera um, and started trying to shoot it. It was really high up. Um, at one point, there were a couple of birds of prey that were fairly high up, you know, flying and circling and this object was much higher than they were, but it at least added another object or another couple of objects into our frame of vision of this circle hovering um, because it was a beautiful uh, blue, clear blue sky, no clouds or anything. So the birds helped give perspective in terms of my husband trying to take pictures of this thing. Um, just hovering and it sort of seemed to... Um, like slightly bounce or, or pulse or, or throb. I'm not quite sure how to describe that, um, but just hovering there. Um, at times it seemed to kind of flash a, a reflective appearance. Um, so maybe that could have been a, a light blinking. I, I got more of an impression of it, you know, just showing it maybe a different side or and then it seemed to just sort of recede upward and disappear. It was uh, <laughs> never seen anything like that. And just astonishing when we looked at my husband's pictures later, um, I think he got two at least where you can see an elongated sort of flash of light above the shapes of the birds, you know, and my impression of the picture was that didn't look anything like what we were seeing. But of course, the eye of the camera, I think, is able to capture more or see more. Um, yeah, it was uh, just astonishing. When you saw this dot of white move and then stop, did it just seem to be absolutely fixed in one spot, or did it seem to kind of be floating in a general area? It was stopped. It was hovering. Now, was was this round like a well-filled round balloon, or uh, was it slightly oblong? Can you? What did your naked eyes tell you about this dot? It's seemed very round mm -hmm. to my naked eye, uh, to the best of my ability. And like I said, after, you know, spending some time and maybe even seeing other things on the internet, I thought, well, that could have been a diamond. It was so far up, so far away, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, was, was this as high up, do you think, as commercial airplane traffic, like 25, 35,000 feet maybe? You think that high? I think it was maybe higher than that. Um, it was higher than what we normally see planes around here. Um, it was really high. <laughs> I initially thought I might know what she and her husband saw, but the observation that the object stopped and hovered for a short while threw me off track. Most everything else about that report made me hone in on a high-altitude science balloon. But how can a balloon just stop in the sky? Balloons are captive to the wind.
and that triggered recent research I'd done on Google's Loon Project. This project used a rather simple technique of guiding a drifting balloon to go from one altitude in one direction, say, drifting westerly at 103,000 feet, and then ascending another 10,000 feet to where the prevailing stratospheric wind direction is going easterly. During my research, I read that Project Loon is involved in a secret testing of using AI in the operation of their balloon flights, artificial intelligence. So might this have been one of those secret flights where they can steady a balloon in a particular spot, for example? No one I contacted involved in Project Loon got back to me, so I queried NASA JPL, who I discovered during my research had released a high-altitude balloon package on the day that the witnesses had their sighting. This balloon was launched from New Mexico and tracked over the Colorado area. In fact, when I contacted the media department at Wallops Flight Facility on the Del Marva Peninsula, Mr. Jeremy Eggers, the head of communications at Wallops, was eager to talk with me, and he explained about the NASA JPL balloon that was seen by the witnesses and multiple witnesses in the Colorado area that day. Yes, I mean, uh, given uh, the photo that you sent us and just kind of some of the descriptors that were given, uh, I would say there's certainly a good possibility that they spotted one of our scientific balloons. Now, can you tell me what might account for the observation by both witnesses that the balloon stood still for about five minutes? What would account for that behavior? So the way the balloon behaves... um, I mean, this is—it's an enormous balloon, right? I mean, it's—you know—it's on the order of you know more than a hundred blimps that could fit inside of one of these balloons. So they're very large structures. They um, fly at an altitude, um, I believe, for that mission, we're at about 120,000 feet. So at that altitude, you're in the stratosphere, and um, you know the balloons are unguided. They—they uh, uh, they go with the wind. And so any movement of the balloon would have been the balloon going with the wind, uh, with the wind pattern in the stratosphere. Um, You get it from from a a long distance away. It would would have appeared to just be very stable in the air, um, but uh, and and really just kind of stationary. Uh Yeah, if if the winds were just uh, very still in the stratosphere. but even, you know, again, even if it was, say, traveling at, you know, 50 miles per hour, such a large structure and viewed from such a distance away, I mean, I still think it would have probably looked, you know, fairly static, if you will, in the, uh, um, you know, as viewed from afar. Uh-huh. Well, um, I had read recently that at least for Google's Project Loon, um, there is a engineering team that is working at using AI. I was just wondering if your balloons out of JPL NASA, if they had any of that technology, but they don't necessarily at this point. It's purely however the stratosphere is pulling or pushing the balloon. That's correct, yeah. We go with the wind. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, this has been very instructive. As as you probably know, there are an awful lot of UFO reports generated by high altitude balloons and even ham balloons, those people who are flying them across the state at a relatively low altitude, you know, just mylar type balloons generates a lot of uh, UFO reports. So it's good when we can actually pinpoint uh, a, a scientific flight that is parallel to this particular um, witness sighting. So that was very helpful. I appreciate your time on that. No, and thanks for, certainly thanks for your call and your interest. And uh, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, we, uh, I, I, I'd say, especially for those flights we do from New Mexico, which already sort of has, right, that kind of you know, history of, of UFO sightings and such, and, you know, in some regards, even part of a culture in some of the towns down there and, and whatnot. But um but, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to check into it and give us a call and learn more about what NASA is doing with these scientific balloons. They're really a neat, te- uh, neat technology. 
The stratosphere, where these balloons gather all their science data, is a fascinating area of our atmosphere that we're still learning a lot about. It extends for over 20 miles from its lowest, where the troposphere ends, to its highest, where the mesosphere starts. So from about 6 miles up to 30 miles up, there are various wind directions and wind speeds that occur. That allows for a lot of leeway in wind direction and speed. And, as Mr. Eggers stated, looking at a football stadium-sized balloon that is around 12 miles up in the air, well, an object that big and that high can, even at a speed of around 50 miles an hour, appear to be essentially stationary to observers on the ground. If you're interested, information on this case, 16042, can be seen at the links provided on our show notes. Now, it was photographic evidence that provided what was needed to identify that high-flying object. The witness's husband had a high-quality camera and took several very good pictures at high resolution. Zooming in very tight on these high-res photos showed a remarkable degree of detail the characteristics of a scientific balloon became apparent. Oh, had there only been photographic evidence in the Brooklyn case I'll discuss next. This is API Case Files. It went in a straight line, I tell you no lie. It covered at least a thousand, at least a thousand feet, that had to be one second. <laughs> like how? It just shot away like it knew, like almost I felt like it knew we were about to record it. API case 16029 took place in Brooklyn, New York in the early evening of July 16, 2016. Interestingly, the New York area has a fair amount of sightings. In fact, our deputy director, Paul Carr, will be discussing his New York case in just a few minutes. My Brooklyn case was a two-witness sighting that completely flummoxed the husband and wife who found themselves staring at and trying to make sense of an object displaying the most unusual aerial movement they had ever seen. Here are the details as told by both witnesses. I had just come from work and we decided, okay, let's go out to have dinner. It was about between 7.50 and 8.30. I can't remember the exact time. And uh, so while walking out there on, this is in Brooklyn, uh, Utica and Church Avenue. We stood at the corner of Utica and Church Avenue. Uh, While we were walking up there to cross the street, I looked up and I saw something that looked like a helicopter, but it got my attention because it was just, you know, it stood still. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's something happened. And my wife just says to me, hey, is that standing still? And so when I look up, uh, I see something absolutely mind-boggling. It's just standing still, just as she said. And I started looking for, you know, I'm, I'm about to tell her this is a helicopter, but uh, I didn't see any rotors. I didn't see a tail. I didn't see any numbers, no windows. I didn't see the, um, the two landing up things that are underneath the helicopter. Uh, I, I immediately knew it wasn't a plane because we don't have planes that hover unless they're military planes. And um, this was something that I've never seen before. So as we're looking at it, because we're a bit stuck in awe, uh, it went from hovering to immediately uh, left and right. And when I say left and right, I mean pretty much like, uh, I'd say it probably went about uh, four feet left and back immediately. I I mean, like, almost like like a slingshot, like ping, ping. Then it cut into a letter, like a letter C, right in the air, like from one angle to another, which by that time there, I told myself, wait a minute, we have nothing that does this. I mean, how do you go left to right? Then you cut a C, like a letter C in the air, and then you cut like what appears to be like a broken Z, like like a zigzag. 
And then, and then from the zigzag, uh, right then and there, that this is when I started taking out my telephone so that I could videotape this. And I swear, it's almost, I tell you, no lie, it, it, it was there until I started aiming my phone. When I started to, to about to aim the phone, when I started bringing it up, it just shot out. It was standing still. So my wife says to me, hey, is that a plane standing still? And when we started looking at it, this is when it started like making these odd um, aerial moves. I mean, very fast. I, I can't tell you, man, how fast. But it made these moves so fast. I said, geez, what is that? I just can't believe it. And, and then just as it's about to do the broken Z, which I, would, I kept my eye on it, but it, you know, I couldn't pull out my phone. And, uh, and just as I was doing that, it went in a straight line. I tell you no lie. It covered at least a thousand, at least a thousand feet. That had to be one second. <laughs> like how? It just went zigzag upside, and you know, and it, it just left so fast. It just shot away, like it knew, like almost. I felt like it knew we were about to record it. I just did not, but I don't know how could that be, man. You know, I, you know, something the mind plays tricks on you. Sometimes, you know, you think it's coincidence. I'm going to be honest here. It kind of felt like it knew I was going to record it. I just couldn't, I just kind of, I can't imagine how nobody's seen it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I went online looking for anyone who may have uh, reported this. And, and uh, thank God my wife was there because, uh, you know, I, who would believe us? I mean, this is something, and why here in New York, where we're so populated, I just can't imagine that nobody's seen this. But I've never, ever, 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 ever seen anything like this. I wish I had never seen it. But I just didn't want to be quiet. Uh-huh, yeah. Were there other people on the street? Did you notice anyone other than your wife on the street during this um, occurrence? There were several people on the street, but... But I, I don't know, me and my wife, I, I, to be honest too, we were so awestruck. It's not like we yelled out, which, which from now on, I'm, I've already uh, uh, made myself think this. From now on, if I ever see anything in the sky, I'm going to yell, what is that? I, I just, I'm, I'm not going to stay quiet like I did last time. The last time, this, this first time that this ever happened, it was so it was shocking. Uh-huh. Shocking. Like, you know. Would you ever expect to see this on your own? Never. Uh, There's just no words for it. I can tell you now. Yeah, I can understand. The, and the movement that it, the, this is what convinced, the, the movement that it made, and, and what I saw, I, I can tell you what it looked like. Imagine a helicopter. No rotors. No tail. No window. Um, it was kind of like a helicopter slash maybe some cylindrical. I know for sure this is not a plane, it's not a helicopter, and definitely not a drone. And I'm basing the fact that it's not a drone of any sort based on how it took off in a straight line because it covered, I tell you, no lie. Uh, I would say a thousand feet, but I would have to say maybe more because it just was, it was just out of here, like vanished. But it covered that thousand feet, one second, poop, gone. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my God, what is this? Did it fly away and just disappear into the sky, or did it get out of your field of view because of buildings or something? It, it went straight so fast. i tell you how fast it was. It went so fast that the lights that were on it, it, it didn't leave a streak. Your eyes could almost, it's like your eyes are fooling you. Like, like you, you could almost still see those red uh, globes. They were like uh, sphere, like, like a round globe, two of them, uh, left and right. Uh, you could almost see them in the air, even though it was gone already. Mm. I mean, it was gone. When I say gone, I'm gone. Um, I wish I, I kind of can't explain it, man. It's very hard to explain. I've never ever seen anything like this ever, never. And it's left no burning trail, no. You know how you know how the uh, the stuff that we have. There's always some type of uh, uh, fossil fuel being burned out, whether it's jet fuel or something. It made no disturbances in the air other than its movement. You could see um, no None. energy field around it. None. Okay. Was it the apparent size of a helicopter body, bigger, smaller? I think it was a little bit smaller than that. Uh-huh. I think a little, bit, a little bit smaller than that. That's, that's why at first we thought it was a helicopter about 500 feet up in the air diagonally. 
it was um I, I would say like um like a cobalt blue grayish mm-hmm. color. Mm-hmm. Um I I'm not exactly sure on that because the two lights that were on either side of it were so bright, even though they were red that it kinda dis it kinda like um it kind of masked what it was. Now, on, on this object, these lights were on the side of what you would consider a fuselage, not running along the underside of it? They were on the side or under it? No, they, they, looked, like they, were, they looked like they were in the middle between the, between the underside and the top side of it. I would say that they were pretty much in the middle, almost like, almost like, the, view, almost like the cars that we have where the lights are right kind of in between the top and the bottom, Uh similar to that, but it was two red lights on either side. I would say it was far bigger than a a red, a red traffic light, Mm -hmm. far bigger than that. No pulsating, just bright. Uh, Did you feel any change in atmosphere or any quieting of sounds or any atmospheric phenomenon associated with your sighting? None. Sounds were normal and activity was normal. Yeah, the, the only phenomenon that I could tell you was that it was so shocking we stood on this corner 40 minutes hoping it would come back. Uh-huh. That's the only thing that I could tell you. We, we were like almost immobilized. We didn't even go for dinner. I mean, this is funny. We didn't even bother to go for dinner because we were just standing there hoping that this thing would come back again. We stood on this corner about 40, 45 minutes just waiting like two fools. And, and we were looking in the sky for so long. People were looking at us. <laughs> were the skies clear? Did you have good visibility? The weather was, um, you know, it, it was in the evening time. I can't say partly cloudy because, because if it was partly cloudy, the clouds were really high. Okay. And mm-hmm. and where this object was, there was absolutely none, no no cloud. I'm trying to figure the altitude. About the same altitude as a helicopter would fly. No, it was a little bit lower because, especially around especially around this neighborhood, there's always a some type of a fighter shootout or something. So when the helicopters are around here, when they're flying, they're normally about maybe anywhere between 500, 600 feet. You know, you can clearly hear them. You can, you can hear them four blocks away when they're that low. You know, and, and it kind of feels like they're right near you, but they're not. They're like three blocks down. It's that you hear the rotors and, the, you know, the echo of it, but it made absolutely no sound. It's, it's not even the fact that, it, let me tell you what it is. It's not the sound. I don't care if it made sound or not, it, even though it did not. It was the movement of it that I just told myself, wait a minute, what am I seeing here? Like the only time I've ever seen do this kind of moves are like dragonflies. You know, you've seen dragonflies uh, on lakes and how they, how they zip in and they zip out. And uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I just have never ever seen anything like that in my life. Nothing. Now, was it reflecting? Was it reflecting any light at all? Did you could you tell if it was metal or if it may have been organic? Um, it looked like it was in some type of metal, because I could see even though it was the evening time, the shell of it looked like the shell on uh, on say an M M&M and M or a Skittles. You know, it had like this uh, particular shine to it, uh, even though it appeared dull in color, like uh, I'd say anywhere between a, a bluish black, a blackish blue uh, metal color. I, I can't tell you what material it was made out of, but I know that I did see something that that looked like two red lights, two big round red lights. It's, it's a little bit hard to, to explain the actual color mm-hmm. because the two red lights that were... Uh, uh, one on the left and one on the right. These, like I said, these lights were big. I couldn't. I just can't believe that nobody else would. I can't believe that nobody else saw this. I can't believe that they didn't look up. I, they kept looking at us. One looked up. It, it's not uncommon. Yeah, no, it's not uncommon. So if you look up, one minute it's there, the next minute it's not. Uh-huh. I went to my friend's house um, the following day. Yeah. And um, I just couldn't stop talking about it. I just couldn't stop talking about it. I don't know what it is. It was just, it was amazing. Amazing. I I wish I had never seen it, but I won't trade it for the world. It was pretty obvious during my interview that an extraordinary object had been witnessed by these two. 
I contacted and spoke with the police precincts surrounding the area of the sighting, but no one called in to make a report to police authorities. However, the National UFO Reporting Database shows that in the New York City area that night, July 16, 2016, there were three other UFO reports of a similar nature. After due research and a careful investigation, I was unable to find any rational explanation for the object or the object's characteristics. I closed this case as unidentified. Now, as I mentioned, Paul Carr just closed as unidentified a Manhattan case, number 16035. This sighting took place on August 3rd of 2016. Here's Paul with the details. Yeah, it was a photographic case, single witness. Uh, Now, normally, a single witness case wouldn't really... uh, Move the needle much for API, but this guy did have three pretty good photographs of some kind of object in the sky over Manhattan near the Freedom Tower in downtown Manhattan. Um, I don't know if how many people have been there lately, but uh, on the site of the old World Trade Center, they built a, built a new tower, which is uh, not not the world's tallest, but it's it's up there amongst the world's tallest. And uh, th- this uh, particular witness is a big fan of that building. He, He's definitely an enthusiast, and every time he drives by there, uh, he want, he likes to get a photo of it. And it was a beautiful, clear late afternoon in August of this year, and uh, probably not a cloud in the sky as far as I can determine from the weather. And you can see in the reflection of the building windows a, a nice blue, clear sky. And it he got stuck in traffic a little bit. So he, he took the opportunity to jump out of his vehicle and take some snaps of the tower when he was right in front of it. He noticed a, an object moving slowly up where, what he perceived as being uh, up high along the tower. And he, he took uh, three shots of this object in rapid succession. Uh, the total was about four seconds from the first shot to the third shot. Then he he says he remembers it disappearing completely. Now, he said it disappeared. Was he looking directly at the object and it was gone, or he looked away and it was gone? He said, no, he he didn't look away. He said it was gone instantly. Uh, Now, remember, we're dealing with a signal witness here, so this person's memories, Mm -hmm. um, as we know, memories are rather rather malleable. Uh, I don't think he's a liar. I think he's telling me the truth as, as he remembers it. There are some things in his story that make me think that that his memory might might have been uh, somewhat corrupted by discussing it with other people, but yeah. uh, which happens that happens to me too. I, it's not, I'm not. It's not. It's not a. It's not a flaw in your character if that happens. That's just how memory works. But uh, did it really disappear instantaneously? I don't know. Uh, what we don't have is a fourth. Is that fourth photograph with nothing in it? That mm-hmm. I, if we really had, if we had that, I would be. That would be really exciting. Well, you know, it's damn near straight out of central casting that these objects just disappear. I mean, you hear that so often from witnesses, uh, witnesses that haven't even been involved. They don't even think about UFOs. But what strikes them that they just cannot get over is how something was there and then Looking at the object, it just wasn't anymore. That really bends some people's minds, and it reworks their gray matter something fierce. Yeah, so it would it would it would bend thing. my mind too. I think uh, I've never seen anything like that. But uh, but we we've had people I, I consider credible people who've, who've noted either something disappearing very rapidly within a second mm-hmm. or two, or mm-hmm. disappearing instantaneously. And by the way, we might have him on in a future episode, so I don't want to steal all his thunder, but what we did get from him was three shots from a, a I believe it's a Samsung 
phone, uh, one of the fairly recent phones. It has good quality. And I was able to zoom in and see this object. It pretty consistent from frame to frame. It was moving about twice its diameter per second. But I couldn't determine the altitude. So I don't I couldn't tell you if it's if it's the size of um a kite or if it's the size of, of a building. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. The the problem with the, any of these things if if there's nothing in the background, nothing behind it, uh right. you can't even bound the altitude. But I think we can pretty much rule out an aircraft or a helicopter. Uh, or even a drone. It, it, it's a rather odd shape. Uh, it's nothing like a classic flying saucer or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. He thought this was a very powerful experience for him, and, and he felt very strongly about it. He wanted to report it to us, and we had a long conversation about it. And he um, provided me the three photos right out of the camera, uh, unaltered, and I was able to make do some analysis. I do think that the photos are genuine. They are nothing like any of the fakes we've seen. Uh, they they appear to be an actual image of something. What it mm-hmm. did remind me of a little bit was the case we worked back uh, a couple of years ago out in uh, Northern Maryland. Uh huh. Yeah, I remember that. There was th- that case and a related case that had this sort of building like appearance, like these bright spots on this kind of squarish looking thing. Now, I'm not saying that this is the same thing. Mm -hmm. I I, I won't make that claim, but it it intrigued me that it was enough similarity that we had to, uh, I wanted to look into it. Um, I do have another photograph from another witness also in Maryland, uh, but from a different date uh, of something that was floating or suspended in the air some distance away, which he took with a uh, his cell phone photograph of it. You, you only it's all, we only have a we don't have very many pixels <laughs> across, mm-hmm. but we can, it does look similar. That New York case, um, when I looked at that photograph, I found it an almost strange wedge shape. Got me to thinking that it looked very similar to a photograph that had been released without a date by um, witnesses unknown that had a actually video of this wedge-shaped large object in the sky that was over Columbus. Columbus, oh. Ohio? Uh-huh. But it looked very similar to that, this strange wedge shape and, and not symmetrical. It was kind of like a chunk was hanging down. And I've seen that several times. Now, the only caveat is that the video that was released, was released through Secure Team 10. Oh, yeah. And I know they're hoaxers. And, they are, yes. you know, here's the thing, that if you know a group is a known hoaxer, then anything they put on is suspect. They lose any confidence that what they're showing is genuine. Yeah. But I'd seen this before, and it was very similar to this picture of yours. So maybe we could put the picture of that object, uh, a close-up of that, on. Oh yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. Something like that. I would. Yeah. L- I would love to know if any listeners have seen something similar, or uh-huh. photographed something similar. Uh, I, I, we may have a pattern emerging here, and we, that's one thing we always do here. Is we always, you know, we don't expect any case to be a smoking gun. No. But we do hope to find patterns, and when I get on a pattern, I get really interested. So uh, this might be one. We'll keep looking for those kinds of patterns. Yeah. All right. Well, Antonio, did you have any uh, recent cases that you wanted to speak to? I do have one interesting case, and it is a tex- uh, Texas case. This one's out of uh, Tumble, Texas. This struck me as interesting because the witness claims that she has been seeing these these uh, strange lights um, and a whole assortment of different types of objects, almost according to her email, every single night uh, for quite some time. Uh, Stresses that it's not a joke. Uh, Sometimes uh, she's frightened and has seen everything from uh, saucers, cigar shapes, uh, triangles, uh, both big and small. And uh, initially she was quite receptive, you know, sent multiple emails and we we exchanged a couple emails back and forth. Um, I have not heard back uh, in about a week now. 
but I did do some checks, and there are some there are some cases, uh, historical cases dating as back as 2013 for the for that area, and they're mostly the same: strange lights, uh, some triangular sightings, and at these websites are usually uh, associated to like uh, TexasUFOs.com, which is heavily uh, basically regurgitations of MUFON cases, mm-hmm. um, and there's some okay videos on on YouTube also for the uh, for that same area. Um, I did not find any, you know, initially what I would do is look for any uh, type of uh, military bases, defense contractors in that area. Um, so there's no Air Force bases, uh, as far as I know, no military defense contractors out there. The closest airport, uh, it's called David Wayne Hooks Memorial Airport, just a couple of miles away. Mm-hmm. And I did some research on that as well. I did not see any UFO cases associated with uh, the David Wayne Memorial Airport. Some things about the witness. Um, she is fairly old, uh, over 85. So that is worrisome for me when it comes to uh, trying to communicate with the witness, perhaps even retrieving some some information. So an 85-year-old witness, to me, is going to be rather difficult to uh, communicate with, both verbally and through the internet. Now, she has not consented yet to to a telephonic witness interview. She has not, but she has replied to me and said yes. She was she was very excited to to uh, to participate. Well, to be to be interviewed, and I replied, uh, "Great, uh, give me some dates. This is my availability. I'm going to wait a little while longer, and in the meantime." The last few days, I did some research for that area, and I expanded a little bit out uh, over. You know, it's not that far from Houston, so uh, possibly she's seen something that is as far out as Houston. She doesn't really give us distance. Um, basically, it's every night she sees something uh, in basically every shape you can think of, and uh, so I'll just keep. Uh, I'll send a couple more emails. Uh, again, an eighty-five year old might not be checking their emails every five minutes like we do. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope she gets back in touch with you because uh, when I when I did the initial paperwork and built her case file and everything, it looked pretty interesting. But yeah, you don't you have no idea if she's suffering from mm. dementia or if she's actually seeing these things. So it'll be good when you get the witness interview and you might have some idea of what her state of mind is. I'm no psychologist, but when when and I'll I'll read verbatim here. This is where we have to be careful because you don't see this typically. Of UFO cases, but she's she's pleading, begging for help. Um, mm. So that in itself could be a psychological uh, thing that we have to take into consideration. So someone pleading for help regarding UFO cases is is, uh, is, is what actually sparked my interest. You know, so yeah. let's see what happens. Well, let's let's move this on over to our interest in um, adding to our API team. You know, we're looking for. A few good investigators. Now, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, both of you are are in the academic and science field, and and uh, I would think that academicians and scientists would be a great addition. You know, they already know how to look at things dispassionately and not be moved by things that just don't make sense. And do you have any colleagues that you know of that are interested? I personally do not. Most of the people that are interested in this type of uh, occupation, I guess you want to say, or, or uh, hobbies, at least the ones that I know that I'm really involved with, take the UFO phenomena not as serious as we do. It's more of something that's uh, on the surface for them. And, I, you know, I can't gauge why. I don't know if they're afraid of their careers or grants or things like that or being called nut jobs. All of uh, the above. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the for the most for the most part, a lot of them at the mention of UFO will giggle. On occasion, on occasion, there are a couple of uh, scientists out there, out here in the Florida Space Institute, just outside Orlando, that kind of you know look at it from from a a personal perspective, but they would never be caught actually investigating this type of phenomena. Yeah, that that's a problem that we have very commonly that the la- so called laughter curtain. Yeah, these could be people that actually seen a UFO. There's a colleague of mine here at St. Peter's College who, who teaches uh, chemistry, uh, you know, PhD and everything, you know, great scientist, and doesn't want to touch it. You know, he says, uh, oh, yeah, I've seen UFOs before. And, and when you try to engage in a conversation, it's like the topic quickly changes. That disconnect 
is so disappointing that here's people, learned people, that are so afraid of this topic that they would not be caught dead engaging in it, even well, as witnesses. Normally, the ones that you do see are, are, are have retired. Whenever you go to like to these MUFON big conferences and things like that, that you see the retired physicists, the retired chemists, the retired astronaut. The re, you know, it's always post mortem that mm. they, they they decide to invest. You know, to gauge engage into this this. Uh, this environment, this world that we live in, you know, to me, I don't really care. I, I'm not in it for anything other than I like what I'm, I like studying this phenomenon. People. Well, part of draining the swamp is to get some good scientists involved in doing investigations. And this catch 22, a good scientist wouldn't be caught dead doing this investigation. I don't know how to get around that. A lot of these guys are concentrated on one thing, getting published and getting grant money. That's basically their life, unless they, they've got tenure at some, some big universities. and um, They just don't want to be caught in it. That is the unfortunate world we live in. Who shaped that? We, I don't know. Um, it's unfortunate. I don't see any of that changing in the near future, uh, except for those who come out of the retirement pool. Well, I think the retirement pool is, is our best hope. Uh, hmm. It's a pool I hope to join in the next few years. Uh, and and Marcia, you're retired. And... So we we have uh, yeah it, I, I agree with Antonio it's not going to be people who are uh, either young scientists trying to make a reputation for themselves or more senior uh, mid career scientists who are protecting grant money and and reputations. So for at least for the now it's going to be largely an amateur occupation. I don't even try to recruit people where I work because I, I'm afraid that that they will regard that as uh, creepy or strange. So if somebody wants to come to us, yeah, great. Most who joined the uh, aerial phenomena, and maybe even MUFON, had the intent of that they were going to discover something big. They believed in aliens, and they saw that every single case that we've done was, was rather mundane, not a whole lot of evidence. And they probably got tired of conducting, after the 7th, 8th, 9th, 20th interview, that there was not much to see, uncooperating witnesses, almost lackluster evidence, and I think that uninspired them. You know, and uh, yeah. there weren't that many sexy cases. There were one or two. They're few and far between. Well, yeah, and you know, we have to, we have to do a better job of telling people, you know, our future investigators, listen, guys, so this is this is as serious as it is. Um, it's going to take some dedication, and there's not much to see there, you know, and. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll get that big case. I don't know if we've mentioned this before in the show, but we did lose Robert Kolb. Uh, he passed away. Uh, he, yeah. wa- he was uh, uh, he was trained in science and he was helping out a lot. Uh, he was great in photo forensics. Yeah, oh, he, he he understands image analysis, but I'm afraid we we lost him. Uh, we lost another person uh, simply because he 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 realized how time consuming it was, and he just said, with everything else going on in his life, he just didn't have the time. I think you, you know. I, I think I think also um, locality is important. When you get a very strong case, and you are hundreds and thousands of miles away, and you just physically can't go there, and you keep getting those and getting those and getting those, and you're not getting the ones that are directly in your zip code, uh, I think that you know most people want to investigate UFO phenomena within a driving distance, right? Uh, you know. Sure. Well, from where I sit, the vast majority of cases that come through. Um, you can nail them down pretty quick. There's only maybe three or four in a calendar year that you can't pretty much get a grasp on. And I think that somebody who might be interested in this type of job is somebody who is a pretty computer literate, knows how to hit the web and nail down some information, knows how to use PC applications to find out what's in the sky when this was reported and knows a little bit of astronomy, just basic stuff, just a real basic autodidact who likes to connect dots and find answers is good for this particular job. I don't know that we ever think of ourselves, at least for the aerial phenomenon investigations team, we aren't interested in proving if there are aliens. What we're interested in doing is trying to find out an explanation for
for the object that a person reported observing on a given time. And that anybody who's interested can sit and do from their home in their jammies with a cup of coffee normally. I see it with the paperwork that comes in. Easy to see. That, believe it or not, was Venus in the morning sky. That, believe it or not, was the International Space Station. I can show you exactly when it tracked over you, corresponds with your sighting. Um, all these kinds of things are typically what we find. Very rarely do we get these cases like Paul had and like I finished there in, in New York and the one I'm working on in Michigan right now. Um, but those are fun, but they are not our bread and butter cases. Yeah. Well, we're looking, we're looking for patterns. We will explain many cases. Other cases will say, well, it could have an explanation, but it's, it's not clear what it is. And every once in a while we get one that's, wow, what was that? You know? Yeah, it's how a did, head scratcher. How did that happen? And uh, those are not not going to be a common. So that we need we need people who can be persistent and and just enjoy learning things, enjoy puzzling things out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know maybe you could replace your daily Sudoku or or New York Times crossword <laughs> instead just puzzle out the case. A That's and yeah. it's usually a few hours invested of your time in each case. Uh, in some of the cases, it may be a lot more than that. And I agree with Antonio. We'd love to get cases where we can actually physically go to this, where the, the sighting occurred, speak to the witness, have them show us everything they saw. Uh, and we, we have done that a few times, but we don't do it that much. And we'd love to do it more. And the yeah. way we're going to do it more is by getting more investigators, uh, in more locations and mm -hmm. more reports. And yeah. uh, the way we're going to get more reports is by slowly building this reputation as the organization to report things to, where you get a serious, sober investigation, you get respected, you get your report taken seriously, but our conclusion is what it is. Um, and uh, an investigator could be someone who believes that there are aliens contacting Earth. That's fine. As long as you don't let your belief system cloud your judgment about individual cases. Yeah. So we're looking for sober-minded individuals who are interested in um, investigating uh, somebody who is not afraid to roll up their sleeves, follow the dots, and see where it leads them. We're looking for people who know how to use the normal tools on the Internet anymore and the normal applications that you can get on any any handheld device, somebody who has the time to devote, which isn't all that much time. Right. And and also uh, someone who communicates with the rest of the team on a regular basis. All I'm asking is once a month updates on the cases. Yeah, well, we do have a requirement to check in. So we'll make available on our uh, website the the type of thing we're looking for and uh, how to contact us and if you're interested or you know somebody who might be definitely get in touch with us and we'll start the ball rolling next up paul carr's thoughts on scientific sky watching this is unidentified science number eight in the series scientific sky watching Anyone can go outside, look at the sky, and just see what they can see, day or night. I hope you do this when you can. For me, going out on a clear, moonless night under a dark sky and looking up for a long time is a great pleasure. And if you haven't tried it, I think you might want to try. I don't get to do it as often as I like, partly because of uncooperative weather here in the Mid-Atlantic. Each time, I reorient myself to the season's constellations and know where the planets are. I see a great deal of air traffic here near Washington, D.C., and the occasional satellite. If I am lucky, I will see a bright meteor. Scientific sky watching is something altogether different from sky watching for pleasure, however. Each sky watch is part of a larger experiment, and an experiment begins with a hypothesis. We aren't just about watching long and hard enough to spot UAPs. Our purpose is to put a large area of sky under surveillance over a long period of time, 
and then to compare UAP report frequency to measures of how tight our surveillance is. For this purpose, sky watching is at all times of day and night and in all conditions. Beautiful moonless nights will not be the norm. If we spot UAPs, great, but the experiment works just as well if we don't. We're trying to understand if reports are at all sensitive to the skies overhead being watched. This is real science we can do, even if we don't understand the phenomena that trigger UAP reports. We will need trained sky watchers selected for their patience, focus, and ability to work as part of a team. Sky watchers are not UFO chasers, but serious researchers who understand it is important to be persistent and to keep good records. This is science, not reality TV, which I'm sure you know has little to do with reality. Some people who say they love science don't really. They just love the results of science. Real science is hard work and work that often brings little immediate reward or clear new insights. A typical sky watching team will consist of at least four people two spotters, a videographer, and a logger. All teams will practice reasonable operational security to limit the activities of pranksters. Equipment will be appropriate to the conditions and the location, but typically just binoculars, a laptop computer, two-way radios, and a good video camera will be all we need. Most important will be the training of the sky watchers themselves, who will know the night sky, the aviation traffic, and many different types of common weather and space phenomena. Ideally, more than one team would be deployed at a time, so if something is spotted, we can get a good data on altitude, distance, and speed. Careful selection of sky watching areas will maximize the effectiveness of the surveillance. We need an area in which large volumes of airspace can be easily surveyed night and day. We want areas with large populations and many investigated UAP reports. Competently investigated reports are far more valuable than raw reports, since many of the latter are spurious and often triggered by the same pranksters we're trying to avoid. The area I have in mind right now includes five, possibly six counties in Maryland, with the Appalachian Trail on the west, the Chesapeake Bay on the east, Camp David to the north, and National Harbor to the south. This could well include Northern Virginia as well. It's a big area to cover and would require several teams, a less ambitious area is just Montgomery, Frederick, Carroll, and Howard counties. This area is served by three major airports and Andrews Air Force Base is nearby, so the air traffic is considerable, but that is fine. Human sky watching is only one approach, and what I favor is a hybrid of humans in real time and automated cameras scanning the skies using sophisticated algorithms. There may be other ideas that will work too. We need to encourage creativity and collaboration. API is open to working with other organizations and independent volunteers who want to help. It's unlikely any money will change hands, but everyone who participates in a new finding will get appropriate credit. There are a few scientific sky watching principles that, if observed, will make the data far more valuable. 1. Keep detailed records from start to finish and make sure you have an accurate time that can be recorded for each event. Have a system in place so that all types of common events can be recorded. Make sure you record your exact location. Be patient and persistent. Stay at your side as long as possible and come back as often as possible. Remember, it's not about spotting black triangles or flying saucers, although who knows, it could happen, but about maintaining surveillance. If something anomalous does turn up, stay calm and record data carefully. Write everything down afterward as soon as possible. Four, share your data with other researchers. Can we make this happen? If enough of us want to, I think we can. It doesn't mean a shift away from field investigation and towards sky watching, but I am sure there are people who don't feel well suited to field investigation who would enjoy the fresh air and camaraderie of sky watching. Still, it takes a particular sort of person, and I honestly don't know if we have enough of them willing to give it a go. 
How about you? This brings us to the end of API Case Files Episode 10. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart, and you heard also from team members, Professor Antonio Paris and Paul Carr. I would like to sincerely thank the case witnesses and the subject matter expert who provided information and granted permission for their inclusion in this program. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured during this episode were compositions by Living Light, Broke for Free, The Gagarin Project, and Scott Holmes. Our podcast theme is a mashup of two groups, Totality Music and DJ Spooky. If you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show. We always appreciate your input and ideas on content. Email director at aerial-phenomenon.org. Episode 11 of API Case Files and our companion podcast, API Conversations, will be forthcoming with more case discussions, more interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. Meanwhile, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations to your friends and acquaintances. This is API Case File Case File.